Hello, Zach Murphy here, and thank you for tuning into my channel. I want to be giving a teaching today on Romans chapter 15, and if you have been following my channel for some time, you know I've been doing this series on the book of Romans for a long time. And I know I say this all the time, but if you're just tuning in for the first time, I definitely encourage you to go back and look at the previous teachings for the book of Romans. And I know I might sound like a broken record always starting off with that statement, but context is so crucial when studying the Bible. I cannot stress that enough. So without further ado, let me dive right into this, and I want to just start off with prayer. So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your, this opportunity to share your word faithfully over social media, Lord. To share your truth over social media, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would give those listening ears to hear, Lord, and help them understand this, Lord, and give them a desire to go deeper in your word. And I just thank you that this teaching will bring forth much good fruit for your glory, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. So in the previous teaching with Romans chapter 14, I talked about how Paul was distinguishing weak and strong Christians. And chapter 15 is actually a continuation of that in a sense. And I want to start off with verses 1 through 6. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, The taunts of those who taunt you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ so that with one purpose and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who are strong in their faith, and this is Paul going on from the previous chapter with those strong and weak in the faith. And, you know, some of you might be weak in the faith, some of you might be strong. Everybody is at a different place in their walk of faith. And Paul is saying that we should be encouraging one another. And when he says this in verse 1, he starts off saying, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength. He says we ought to do this. Not that we should do this, but we ought to do this. So this isn't a suggestion or something that you should only do when you feel like it. This is something that should be done because the Word of God commands us to. The Apostle Paul says this, is an obligation. This is something that should be a fruit of a believer. We need to reach out and help those who are weak in the faith so that they might become strong in the faith. We shouldn't reach out to them with pride or with arrogance. We should reach out to them with the love of Christ overflowing in us. That is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. And it's so important we don't reach out in arrogance or pride. You know, we do that because we have the love of God in us. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 tells us, Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You know, we should refuse to live a self-pleasing life. Our life is not our own if we are in Jesus Christ. We don't live for ourselves. We live for the glory of God. And we need to drill that home in the churches today. And you know, it's not just within the church we are supposed to not live a self-pleasing life. We are to do it with people in our everyday life, whether or not they are a believer or not. And trust me, I understand that can be a challenge for us at some times with maybe people in our family that are unsaved or people at work or wherever. It might be a challenge. 
but we need to rely on the strength of the Holy Spirit to do this. And this is one of the ways that we share the light of Jesus Christ to others. And I want to refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23, which is Paul writing, For though I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may gain more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might gain Jews. To those who are under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself, so that I might gain those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, I became as one without the law, though not being without the law of God. Under, but under the law of Christ, excuse me. So that I may gain those that are without the law. Verse 22. To the weak in faith I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. You know, Paul sets an example here for us. You know, we are to meet people right where they are, not elevate ourselves up on a pedestal and be like, you can't even get to where I'm at. No, we need to reach out to people where they are, both inside and outside the church. Jesus did not live a life to please himself, and neither should we. We should follow the example that Jesus Christ set before us. You know, one of the things I said in my previous teaching, if you look back at my previous teaching on a biblical view of God's love, I showed how the hyper-charismatic movement likes to focus way too much on the miraculous but neglects repentance. And I want to say something else here, and you know, you know, I identify with, you know, some of the doctrines of, you know, the charismatic movement. I believe in the continuation of all the spiritual gifts. And I believe that God will heal people, God will provide for people. But one of the things I want to say that I have noticed in these charismatic circles is that there is a lack of people wanting to follow this example that Jesus Christ set for us. People want to live a life pleasing for themselves. I've seen that far too often. People are only worried about how big they can get their checkbook by speaking this Bible verse over and over and over again. And you know, this exists in the word faith movement because things have been taken to a far extreme. And we need to get this right. We need, you know... People that like the charismatic stuff, and yes, I believe in the, you know, I believe in the miraculous. However, people are like, well, Jesus healed the sick, we need to follow in that example. Okay, that's great. Yes, we should pray for the sick. But what about the example he set of not living a self-pleasing life? Why are we not following that, church? And I know I'm preaching to myself here. Why are we not following that? And this just doesn't go for the charismatic church, this goes for other churches. But, you know, one of the things I notice with such a overemphasis on, you know, the miraculous and um, word of faith, that there is a lack of compassion for people. I have seen that firsthand. That is something that seems to be very common, sadly. You know, we need to walk a balanced Christian walk, not veering off to one extreme or veering off to another. Um, you know, this is how people see that the light of the world is within us. You know, people look at you that are unbelievers and think, man, that person is so nice. They do these nice things all the time. Why do they do that? in spite of what's going on in the world, in spite of a pandemic, if you even want to call that, but we need to let our light shine. And Paul also talks in this chapter about unity in the body of Christ. 
And I want to say this, true unity is only going to come in the body of Christ when the vision of the body of Christ comes into alignment with the Word of God. We may not agree on all minor issues of doctrine, but we better agree on all major issues of doctrine. You know, some people think, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe, just unite. No, we have to get the major stuff correct. Um, you know, some people want to unite with people that disagree with Jesus being the Son of God. I don't know how you can do that. Some people want to align themselves for the sake of unity of people that accept same-sex marriage is okay. I don't know how you can do that. We need to make sure that there is still a line in the sand. Because if there is no central truth, then there can't be unity in the body of Christ. We have to come into full agreement with the vision of Jesus Christ according to the Word of God, not according to our own man-made standards. And you know, we cannot compromise the critical truths in the Bible. Yes, there are minor things that we can all disagree upon with, you know, Scripture. Minor doctrinal issues, I'm saying very minor ones, but there are critical ones that we should not compromise for. And I can make a teaching on that down the road, which I probably will do. Let's continue on Romans chapter 15 and go from verses 7 to 12. Therefore accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us for the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision in behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praises to your name. Again, he says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the people praise him. Verse 12, again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles hope. The church should be welcoming to all people and to preach the gospel to them and to make disciples. That is what the church is to do. And, you know, he's drawing, you know, Paul's pointing this out because there is still, you know, somewhat of tension between Jews and Gentile believers. And Paul has addressed that in this letter, the book of Romans, and he does that in other letters he has written. And one of the things I want to say here, because, you know, I believe what Paul was addressing as a click between the Jews and the Gentiles. And, you know, we may not have that today in our churches with, you know, Jew versus Gentile. But one of the things I see often, and a lot of people see this, is there are cliques in churches. This group of people only talks amongst themselves, while this other side group of people only talks to themselves, and neither of them really associate. That's not what Jesus Christ wants for the body of Christ. There should not be cliques inside churches. And I know some people may not like me saying that, but that's a hard fact. You know, there should not be these cliques inside of churches. Because that is not how you unite the body of Christ. That is not what the body of Christ is called to be. We are to be united, not with cliques. We are to be united as one, according to the truth founded upon God's word. And you know, Paul brings up this issue of Jew versus Gentile because the Jewish believers in that time, that they think God saving people outside the Jewish realm, they think that that is actually contrary to God's character, which it is not. Paul reminds them that this is supposed to happen with, you know, the Messiah, the Savior of the world coming. And he points to some Old Testament scriptures. He references them. And here's some Old Testament scriptures concerning this. The Jews and the Gentiles all worshiping God together and being reconciled. Psalm chapter 18 verse 49 tells us, Therefore I will give thanks to you among the nations. 
Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 43 tells us, Rejoice you nations with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will return vengeance on his adversaries, and will atone for his land and his people. Psalm 117 verse 1 tells us, Praise the Lord all nations, sing his praises all peoples. It's so important here. You know, what Paul was addressing, you know, with, you know, kind of the division between Jews and Greek believers, or Gentiles, I should say. You know, this is something that was prophesied for everybody to worship the Lord, all nations. And there, you know, as Paul writes later on, you know, the scriptures in Galatians and Ephesians, there's no distinction between Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female. We are all one in Christ. Let's go on to verses 13 to 21, Romans chapter 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And incur, excuse me, and concerning you, my brothers and sisters, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge and able to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering as priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified, by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs, wonders, and the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and all around, as far as Acrylium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He called people to repentance, and he also had signs and wonders follow him. And I say this way, I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already known by name, so that I would not build on other person's foundation, but just as it is written, they have not been told about him will see, and they who have not heard will will understand. Paul concludes his first section of chapter 15, though there are not, you know, when Paul wrote this, he did not break it up by chapters, but he was concluding a section of his work here. And he expresses his desire to see the needs of God's children met. And that should be, you know, what our desire is, to see God meet other people's needs and to pray for that. Galatians chapter 5 verse 5 tells us, For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 21 tells us, Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Paul is not satisfied in anything less than a rich abounding experience of hope as he expects from believers to be abounding in the overflowing love of God. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 tells us, And this I pray, that your love may overflow still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. You know, our love should be overflowing. The love of God should be overflowing through us in every aspect of our lives. And that doesn't mean that we love sin or love the way the world's going. No, we love in truth, in holiness, in light of God's word. And you know, one of the things I want to point out about Paul is his writings have balance in pointing out both the weak areas of a church and the strong areas of a church. Paul has, does a very good job at approaching that with 
balance. And that's something we need. We need balance in all areas of Christianity. And, you know, he also talks about how he presents the gospel. Not just with a call for repentance and faith, but with also spiritual gifts following. You know, some people like to argue the issue of if the spiritual gifts have continued or if they have ceased. And you know, one of the interesting things, the same person that said in 1 Corinthians, I wish you spoke in tongues as much as I did, is the same person that wrote this book we are reading, the book of Romans. That is so powerful right there. Let's carry on to um, Romans 15, 22 to 32. For this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing. So he talks about how he's been delayed to see them. And he hopes to see them on his way to Spain. And to be helped on my way there by you. When I have been first enjoyed your company for a little while. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. From Macedonia to Achaia. Have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do so. And they are indebted to them. For the, if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to them a service also in material things. Verse 28. Therefore, when I have finished this, and have put my zeal on the fruit of theirs, I will go on by the way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in fullness of being, excuse me, the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Verse 30, now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. And that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God, and relax in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So, you know, he talks about his delay and his plan to see them on his way to Spain. He also hopes that they can help him, both financially and spiritually by prayer. And, you know... Paul kept himself busy with the work of God as commissioned. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, this is Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and as far as the remote part of the world. And you know, one of the things also we see here, Paul is aware of Jewish opposition to his work. He is aware of persecution he will face, but yet he is not giving up, and yet he tells them that uh, he his desire is to come to them in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. He wants to be a blessing to every person he comes to in his working. He does that despite being persecuted all the time. Paul is an example here. Everything Paul has done, he has set the bar for living a life that is not self-pleasing. And yet we just get comfortable here in America. We get comfortable here not having persecution, but, you know, we have a hard time sharing the gospel to people. It's time that we wake up to what we are called to do according to what scripture tells us. So important here, we follow by Paul's example here. The last few chapters of the book of Romans really talk about the Christian life here. Christian life principles. Excuse me. It's so crucial for us to live a life that is not self-pleasing. 
you know, not too often do we hear that talked about in churches, but we really need to get this right. We really need to get this area of our life right because if we do this, if we if we conform our life to not being self-pleasing, man, the light of Christ will just shine even more in us than ever before. So let me close in prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity to share your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the people that watch this, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that you encourage them and strengthen them in your walk, Lord, not to live a self-satisfying life, Lord, but to live a life fully surrendered to you to glorify your name and to let your light shine out through them despite the cost of it. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for rising up a remnant of faithful believers. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So once again, thank you for watching this. God bless you and have a great week.